At dawn, he went back to his study and summoned the devil again. Mephistopheles appeared immediately. You already call upon me? Don't you know that I dislike daylight? I have your first task. Casper, one of my drinking companions, sees life through the bottom of a glass. He drinks all his earnings, while his wife and four children live in a crumbling cottage, suffering great misery. Mephisto, make sure that neither liquor nor beer ever appeals to him. What a strange idea. I'm not just curing people from drinking. Quite on the contrary, I encourage them to drink. But my dear Harding... In the same instant, Harding brandished the pledge. Mephistopheles curled his tail under himself, muttered a few curses, and disappeared to perform his first task. The same evening, Caspar went as usual to the inn, leaving behind him his weeping wife and four children. He opened the door of the inn and smelt the usual aroma of beer and tobacco and heard the familiar singing and cheers of his drunken friends. From the threshold, he beheld the room and felt a growing aversion to the place. As through a mist, he noticed his friends waving and urging him to join them. When he saw one of them approaching, beer mug in hand, his resentment grew, turning into a feeling of disgust. Never! Never again! He stepped back, turned round, and ran home as fast as he could. Casper never drank a drop of liquor or beer again. And neither did his wife nor his children ever cry again or suffer poverty. The next morning at dawn, Harding called upon Mephistopheles again. But the sun is just rising. What else, your lordship? You did well yesterday, but let's not waste any time. Here's your next task. In Krakow lives a rich man who made his fortune by cheating and robbing people. The evil spirits have so possessed him that all he does is count his money. Your job, Mephisto, will be very easy. You must persuade Mr. Pinchpenny to change his ways. May he begin to help others. Have him give away part of his fortune to the poor. In one of his houses, have him set up a dwelling for orphans. And in a second one, a shelter for the homeless. That very same morning, Mr. Pinchpenny woke up, sat on the edge of his bed, opened his eyes wide and smiled for the first time in many years. He felt a deep and new conviction that the true meaning of life is in helping people. He dressed quickly and with the same joyous smile on his face ran out of the house. He hurried to his money exchange office and there, to his bewildered employees, gave orders to organise an orphanage and a shelter for the homeless. Time went by, but Harding did not waste it. When he saw sick and suffering people, he healed and comforted them. When he encountered the poor and the hungry, he clothed and fed them. So impressed by his noble deeds were the citizens of Krakow that they started repeating the old saying, Good will always triumph over evil. Mephistopheles patiently endured these humiliations, but only up to a point. When hell began to mock him, he decided he must act. So he appeared uninvited in Harding's study.
<laughs> Your lordship, let us sit down at the table. We need to talk. Let me clarify one thing. Your good deeds, your philanthropy, your mercy, they serve no purpose. You sign the pledge with your own blood. The angels can do nothing for you. Not even the one above, whose name I will not utter, can save you from eternal damnation. So don't deceive yourself, miserable little mortal. Rather than listen to the advice of your wife or the immense of the poor, think of yourself. Enjoy life and the time you have left, for the end is near. <laughs> With that, Mephistopheles disappeared. The words of the devil had made Harding waver. Of course, he is right. I should take advantage while there's still time. He decided that he deserved something more from life. And above all, some beer in the company of his rowdy reprobates. He left his home without informing his wife and marched straight to the inn. Mephistopheles sneaked up behind him. <laughs> hey! It's our do good a Harding! It's been too long! And so the feast began. At once, memories of the good old time spent in nocturnal debauchery flooded back to Harding. While the party was in full swing, the drinking, as often happens, sparked an argument. It was over who had a better horse. My Rod Stallion has a perfect pedigree. There is no faster horse in Krakow than my man. No, man, my steed surpasses all of yours. Rubbish! When my manor picks up speed, <laughs> he's capable of flying. Uh, impossible. Show us his horse. All right, wait here and I'll show you. Harding staggered towards Mephistopheles, who was lurking in the corner. Have a rooster. Stand before. Rooster, which when I sit on, will fly. After a while, Harding went outside, followed by his companions. There, they witnessed a strange sight. A huge saddled red rooster stood among the horses. Harding walked up to him, stroked his head and sat upon him. He pulled the reins, squeezed the sides of the boat with his legs and barked. Cock a doodle doo! Cock a doodle doo! Giddy up, my red mainer! Cock a doodle doo! The rooster took a few light steps, unfurled his wings, and rose into the air. Harding's comrades stood speechless, seeing their friend on a rooster flying gracefully through the night sky, obscuring the moon and stars. He performed flips and tricks, and then for a nosedive shot back up again like an arrow, so high that they lost sight of him. Finally, Harding landed amid applause and cheers. He returned to the inn and reveled late into the night. It was not until morning that he and his rooster managed to reach home with the help of his closest friends. He woke up well into the afternoon and was seized with fear when he suddenly realised that the devil himself was towering over him by his bedside. Well, how are you, your lordship Harding? Are you satisfied with yesterday's performance? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Mephisto, I have an idea. 
Tonight we will organize a race. Of course, my companions will need steeds like Maynard. Ah, I finally chased out the good deeds from his head. Now one thing remains to be done. To lure him to Rome. Your wish is my command. I'll do anything your soul yearns for. <laughs> The same evening, Harding's neighbours, leaning from their windows, witnessed a strange spectacle. In front of Harding's home, five noblemen, infamous for their revelry, full beer mugs in hand, were riding five roosters. Next to them stood an elegant and mysterious gentleman, instructed them how to ride their unusual mounts. Finally, Everyone, including Harding, lined up for the race. At the stranger's signal, the race started. The unusual steeds dashed around the market square. Yeah! Faster! Faster! And they ran faster and faster. And yet they remained on the ground, for the riders kept them down. People, fearing evil charms, hid in their homes, closing doors and shutters. Those who did not manage to get out of the way suffered blows from the wings and scratches from the claws. The riders, however, paid little attention. Overcome by frenzy, they pressed their mounts on, swearing and shouting. Out of the way! Out of the way! Clear a path, From that day on, Harding reverted to his old ways. He no longer sought opportunities to perform good deeds, but instead enjoyed life to the full. Lady Harding was desperate and warned her husband. I see that you have let yourself be deceived by the powers of hell again. I warn you, it will end badly for you. Nonsense. It is the devil that is in my service. But his wife was right. One day, a messenger delivered the following missive to Harding's house. Harding was summoned to appear as soon as possible at the Traveller's Inn near Olkush. Sir, hurry up! Your friends are waiting! Near Olkush, you say? And what could they be doing there? But time was pressing, and without further ado, he jumped on his rooster and in a flash found himself outside the said inn. He went inside and was astonished to find it completely empty. At that moment, a gust blew down the chimney and rattled the windows. A storm had broken out, and amidst the thunder and lightning, Mephistopheles flew down the chimney and into the inn. He stood and laughed devilishly in Harding's face. What is this all about? <laughs> this inn is called Rome. In Rome, the ownership of the soul of John Harding, a nobleman from Krakow, will be transferred to the devil Mephistopheles, Beelzebub's right hand. <laughs> A deal is a deal. I must keep my word, even if it has been given to the devil. So take me, devil! Again, the wind blew and a black cloud sat atop the inn. One could hear the flapping of wings and the cawing of crows. Mephistopheles snatched Harding and flew up the chimney. But the devil, instead of diving with Harding's soul straight into hell, rose through the clouds, soaring ever higher towards heaven. He wanted to flaunt in triumph of the angels at the very gates of heaven. After this, he would carry his trophy into the depths of hell. 
But Mephistopheles was to regret his bold plans. For when Harding saw the gates of heaven and looked down to earth, something stirred in his heart. A painful and ineffable sorrow for his sins sprung deep within his soul and filled his heart. From this sinner's eyes tears flowed, and out of his mouth came a song in praise of God. Harding's singing was so moving and beautiful that the angels, touched by the sincere regret of the unfortunate, flocked to the gates of heaven. Mephistopheles painfully endured Harding's song in the presence of angels, but beyond his diabolical strength was the prayer of Harding's wife, who in tears knelt and wept before the altar of St. Mary's Church in Krakow, praying for the sinful soul of her husband. And thus Mephistopheles, Beelzebub's right hand, was forced to let go of Harding, and he plunged back into hell. The soul of the nobleman floated and finally landed on the moon. What had happened to him? For how many years or centuries had he to repent? Is he still watching the earth from the moon? Nobody knows. It is said that his fervent prayers could be heard echoing through Krakow. But that was a long, long time ago. Harding was a noble man, he called the devil from a hell. His purpose was to set a plan, he wanted his soul to sell. The rooster flies like in a dream, faster, faster on he goes. Oh, part of his evil scheme, how far he'll go, no one knows. When they sat and drank and sang, the devil learned with a smile. Harding reveled with his gang, the devil chuckled all the while. The rooster flies like in a dream, faster, faster on he goes. Oh, part of his evil scheme, how far he'll go, no one knows. Hardin had a kind and good heart, devil had an evil trick. So the Lord's plans fell apart, the devil had the final kick. The rooster flies like in a dream, faster, faster on he goes. Oh, part of his evil scheme, how far he'll go, no one knows. The devil's art was not so strong, Lady Harding's pleas were heard. To whom did Harding's soul belong? Was God with a final word? The rooster flies like in a dream, faster, faster on he 